and uh, you should all have gotten the prompt that you are being recorded, but we are recording this. Um, as part of our push to increase our membership, we think that we're a fantastic organization um, and we hope that you feel the same way. Um, one of the benefits to membership is access to the recordings for all of the presentations that are being given during this conference. Um, if you haven't checked already to see the fantastic lineup of uh, presentations, keynote speeches that are being given for the rest of this month and also in November, um, please do. And I might ask that somebody post uh, a link to the schedule in the chat. Um, I think that we're able to use the chat feature. Um, we will have a question and answer period at the end, and um, we'll try to make that available for people to ask their questions. But if you want to, you know, write them out, you could send it to me in the chat, or you could just post it in the chat, and we'll try to make sure we get to that stuff. Um, the Peace and Justice Studies Association is. Um, it's really important organization to me. It is the North American um, affiliate to the International Peace Research Association. Um, I encourage membership in both. Uh, I think it's particularly special because we're not just scholars talking about things. We're, um, <clears throat> we're scholars and activists and we're trying to get stuff done. Um, we're putting our feet on the ground. We're putting our energies into places where they're really important. And in terms of the thinking um, between myself, uh, Michelle Collins Sibley and Pushpa Iyer, who have been responsible for this October programming, one of the things that was most important to us was to really elevate the stories and really get to the part where the personal and the political intersect. Um, it's, it's not just because it's a pedagogical best practice that our stories are which influence hearts and minds, um, which is, is true and we want to change people, but because there's something about conferences where the reason we go is actually for the conversations we have in hallways and being in this virtual space of having a conference where we don't get to like really meet each other in those kinds of spaces. It's in connecting through the story that that's really important. There's no way I can describe that that is both literally and metaphorically more important than the connection between me and the presenter that we'll get today. Um, you've had a chance to hear, but it really was through one of our attendees um, organizing a philosophy club where we would get together and have something to drink and talk about like what are the deeper implications of poetry and is Rage Against the Machine too political? Um, stuff like that, that me and Saul Neely got to meet each other before either of us, I think, had dreams of becoming doctors ourselves. Um, but the bigger part of the presentation he's going to give is something that I watched through the virtual world and the moment that I had the chance to say, I want you to present your auto, uh, your auto ethnography at our conference next year. He was like, I'm all in and here we are, it's happening. It's just not happening in Florida. Um, mm -hmm. So without further ado, I have a land acknowledgement. Um, again, as part of our recognition that happens in the Peace and Justice Studies Association, we like to acknowledge the land upon which we reside. We express our gratitude and appreciation to those who lived and worked here before us. Those whose stewardship and resilient spirit makes our residents possible on this traditional homeland. Uh, where I'm currently residing, um, the Lenape, Shawnee, Wyandotte, Miami, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and other Great Lakes tribes once resided. Um, we acknowledge the thousands of Native Americans who call Northeast Ohio home. The Ohio area I reside in is a land officially ceded in <clears throat> 1795 during the Treaty of Greenville by 1100 chiefs and warriors. So with that, um, Please check out the schedule, check out the conference, come to our other spectacular events.
become a member, come to future conferences, and enjoy this keynote to be delivered by Dr. Saul Neely. Thank you. Sio Nagata, Uli Haley Sti, Chalagi Gadi Soli, Dagwadoa, Saul Neely Dagwadoa, Ayonega Gadi, Nagu Jigi Ellensburg, Washington, Chinela, Aseno, Alaska, Digegani, Chalagi Degala Dagoi, Aleskul, Di Chalagi de Guadalogui, A Dige Goligue Ye, Dige Wolodi No. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, the, the presentation. My name is Saul Neely, and um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I really uh, appreciate uh, the, the confluence here of, of colleague and former teacher with Jeff Paris, um, who uh, I first met 20 years ago as an undergraduate. I did the National Student Exchange Program from University of Alaska Anchorage. I went to Cal State University Bakersfield and uh, something magical happened there and something that uh, actually changed, uh, changed my life uh, forever. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you make these connections and you have a professor like uh, Jeff Paris here who uh, just gives everything to the student to enable success. Um, I, I just want to say real quick, when I, I did my PhD at Purdue University's Philosophy and Literature, a PhD program, which is where Jeff got his PhD as well, and I was accepted in 2004 without any funding. Uh, Jeff came up to give a keynote presentation at a conference I organized in 2004, and he left, and within a week of him leaving, I got a call from Purdue with full funding. Um, so I don't know what kind of magic uh, Jeff Paris worked for me, but it was, it was brilliant. I'm, I'm forever grateful for that. Um, and that's where I had an opportunity to meet Wim, and, uh, we, you know, we were, back in the day, we were uh, sort of radical and a little bit naughty as students, and it was fun. <laughs> um, but it's a real delight to be here, and I'm glad you all could make it. I hope there won't be too many glitches with the technology. I do have a PowerPoint I'll start up here in a minute. Um, delivering a keynote address via Zoom is kind of a strange uh, phenomenon, I think. Um, but I'm glad we can do this, and I'm really grateful for this opportunity. I also appreciate the fact that Wynn gave um, his land acknowledgement like that. I think these acknowledgements, uh, which are becoming increasingly more um, uh, popular and, and, uh, and whatnot, I, I just think they're important. Um, but I, I think, you know, they perform more than simply speaking healing words. I think they carry within them the imperative for real political processing, real economic material, and phenomenological decolonization. Um, so I'd like to sort of echo that with, with three land acknowledgements uh, briefly. Um, one, thinking about Cherokee, North Carolina, and what is today called the Southeast United States, um, which is the ancestral uh, territory of, of the Cherokee people, uh, where my ancestors had their land stolen from them. Um, I'm going to talk about the Trail of Tears journey I took in the summer of 2019 with my father and my daughter. And um, I went back in November of 2019 to Cherokee, North Carolina, Western North Carolina, to do some more sabbatical research, uh, where I got to an opportunity to work with and meet uh, Sarah Snyder, Brett Riggs, Ben Steer. They're all uh, brilliant Cherokee Studies faculty members um, at uh, Western Carolina University. I had an opportunity to meet uh, renowned Cherokee elder Tom Belt. Uh, Trey Adcock, who does, uh, directs the Cherokee Studies program at um, University of North Carolina, Asheville. Uh, Michael Crow, Nathan Bush, who, who made this gorget that I'm wearing. Sky Sampson, Barbara Duncan, uh, and who introduced me to uh, Bullet Standing Deer. So these were a uh, constellation of people who I ha had opportunity to work with and meet uh, on sabbatical. And then I also like to uh, think about and acknowledge Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Um, which is where my family, well, after the Trail of Tears comes from. Um, but really, prior to my sabbatical research and prior to the genealogy I've been doing with my ancestors over the past three years, really, um, our family's origin story began with Tahlequah. Um, and thinking about people there who have influenced me and um, who have inspired me, I think about my Cherokee language professor, Ed Fields, 
um, David Cornsilk, uh, my cousin Kevin Seidner, and all of my Cherokee Nation uh, scholar uh, colleagues. Um, and then third, uh, even though I, I'm in Ellensburg, Washington right now, I spent the last 11 years on Shingit Ani, the ancestral lands of the Tlingit people at University of Alaska Southeast, a place that I absolutely adore. My daughter was born there, who's 10 years old now. Um, and uh, I never wanted to leave Shingit Ani, but some of you might uh, be apprised of what the current governor of Alaska, uh, who was funded by the Koch brothers and is a friend of Donald Trump, waged uh, just reckless war against our state economy and our university system. And the day, the, the day before, or the, the day that I uh, accepted the position at Heritage University on the Yakima Nation, um, there was a, a real concern. Uh, the Board of Regents at that time for University of Alaska was looking to consolidate our university into UAF, which would have killed all of our programs and tenure doesn't mean anything and all of that. Um, so uh, I still feel like I'm, I'm rooted there in Shingadani, and I'd like to, to thank some folks there, Ishmael Hope, uh, my good colleague, Kune Lance Twitchell, Ernestine Hayes, uh, Luis Brady from uh, Sitka, Alaska, Kiksadi clan, uh, David Katzik, Will Geiger, and, and Noaya. These are people who I think um, it's imperative for me to acknowledge. Um, thinking about land acknowledgement and people acknowledgement because it's the genealogy uh, that's informed most of my thinking here. Uh, and then finally, uh, this morning in preparation for this talk, um, my daughter and I took a sunrise walk to the top of Rattlesnake Dance Ridge and we sang a song to all of these places. Um, she uh, brought her drum up and we were sitting at the top of the ridge and we faced Shingadani and then we're turning and we're singing as well to uh, our ancestral homelands in Western Carolina, uh, Southeast United States, and, and Oklahoma. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm now working from the traditional lands of the Yakima people, which was a nation forged by treaty in 1855 as a confederation of 14 distinct tribal entities uh, and cultures. Uh, so those land acknowledgments and uh, people acknowledgments are important. It's, I think it's a, part, a very important part of indigenous protocol. Um, and I'm honored and excited to offer this keynote presentation for the Peace and Studies Association, especially for October, uh, for which the theme is story and social justice. I'm happy to be here not only to talk about this uh, transformative and restorative journey that I took during the late summer of 2019 with my dad and my daughter, but also because it's really my principal specialty, thinking about the relationship of story and social justice. Uh, one of my favorite books to teach to undergraduate students is Thomas King's The Truth About Stories, in which he reiterates the truth about stories is it's all we are. Um, and I really think that our present political crisis or crises uh, is the consequence of an utterly and radically impoverished political imagination that is both the product and the modality of settler colonialism. Settler colonialism bears within it a radically impoverished political imagination that is the consequence of a radical, radically impoverished relationship to story, right? So I think we suffer an impoverished political imagination because we have an impoverished sense of story and that impoverished sense of story has been the case in Western literary imagination ever since Plato kicked the storytellers out of his ideal republic. Um, you know, in, in, in case, and I, well, I know we have some philosophers in here, but, um, you know, even though it's so common to think about the different starting points between Plato and Aristotle, which are real and distinct, of course, I think together what they've done is they've, um, they've, they've created uh, a hierarchization, a sacralization of philosophy over stories. So Plato kicks the poets, kicks the storytellers out of his ideal republic. Aristotle comes along and says, well, basically, we don't have to kick them out. We just have to learn how to read them correctly. And so he writes his poetics. Um, and, you know, once you start getting into indigenous oral literary traditions, um, or you start to think about uh, other literary traditions that were never conditioned by Aristotle, you really look to Aristotle's poetics and just see how awful it is. I mean, it's, it's it just in terms of thinking about story. I tell my students that 
Aristotle writes poetics as a way of telling you how to read, but really what he's giving you is a way not to read. Um, and, uh, and I think what this, this relationship between Plato and Aristotle, uh, it, it establishes in the Western literary imagination what Foucault calls an ontology of truth. I get this, I get this phrase from Michel Foucault, but I use it towards different ends. Um, but I like the phrase a lot. And I really think that all of Western literary imagination from Aristotle to Matthew Arnold is characterized uh, by this ontology of truth, um, which is to say we've always read literature from the point of view of philosophy since Plato, without really recognizing the fact that philosophy was always historically and epistemologically a moment within the literary. So ever since Plato, we think about story as a moment within the philosophical. We think about the literary as a moment within the philosophical. Um, but that's not true historically or epistemologically. Um, and as you see, I mean, you see this even in Plato's Republic, right? When he uses all sorts of literary devices and techniques in order to make the case why we must banish the storytellers, right? He talks about the metaphor of the sun, the analogy of the divided line, the allegory of the cave, He's got the myth of metals, which introduces the idea of the noble lie. Um, and then at the end, in Book 10 of the Republic, we get, you know, in, in the final banishing of the storytellers, um, except those who will serve the state, of course, um, you know, we get this logocentrism, the sacralization of logocentrism that is predicated on the abjection of women. Um, and, you know, so I, this is where I think Derrida is right. All logocentrism, logocentrism has always been a phallogocentrism. Um, I mean, really think about that from the first moment uh, in which Western philosophy privileges logos, it is predicated and articulated against women from the beginning. There's never an appeal, and as far as I know, in Western philosophical tradition to logocentrism that's not from the beginning predicated against uh, women. And then not only do we get logocentrism, though, but we get the, uh, I, I think today what we see, particularly in scientific traditions, is the persistence of positivism. Um, and positivism in, in my line of work uh, has been really uh, problematic for a couple of reasons. And I'll just give you one anecdote real quick about that. Um, having spent 11 years on Klinket Ani, uh, Klinket co indigenous colleagues and I were working to get an Alaska Native Ecological Knowledge class uh, pass is a GER for non-science majors. Now you got to understand UAS, University of Alaska Southeast, has a 20% uh, Native uh, student body, right? And so um, the, the natural science faculty, uh, all of whom were not indigenous, came back and said no, because it wasn't scientific enough. And it's not scientific enough because it can't be accounted for through this very restricted uh, notion of positivism. And so again, I think that that's a very impoverished understanding of science. And so I ended up picking up ethnoscience as an interest, mostly because of you know, th this effort to try to, to, to bring uh, traditional ecological knowledge into our, our science programs. Um, and then just in terms of thinking about um, uh, you know, the, the impoverished political imagination that we're suffering. I mean, we can think about this in terms of the of justice and the, and the prison industrial complex. Um, you know, uh, I know, I mean, this, it's, a, it's an interesting coincidence, right? I mean, Jeff Paris, Wim, and myself, um, we've all taught in prisons. In 2012, I started a prison education program called Flying University that brought university students into the prison. Um, and again, the prison was Lemon Creek Correctional Center in Juneau, Alaska where we have an over-representation of indigenous people. Um, statewide, Alaska Native uh, people make up about 17% of the state population, but they make up 37% uh, of our prison population. Um, and so, uh, but you know, this whole idea of retributive justice, this whole idea of the prison industrial complex, these are not indigenous in origin, and they are extensions of settler colonialism. In the same way that we can think about, um, and actually, <laughs> I get this from I got this from Jeff a long time ago. I remember one day at a conference, um, I, I forget which conference this was, but um, Jeff had made the comment that the answer to the problem of the prison industrial complex is always more prison. Right? I'll never forget the time that Jeff said that at a conference, 
And that's the point, right? Because we have, we lack an unbelievable, we, we, just, we just lack the political imagination to think otherwise than the prison industrial complex. Um, and the same is true with uh, climate change and, and environmental degradation. I mean, we have to see climate change as an extension of settler colonialism, just as the prison complex is an extension of settler colonialism. Um, and so the problems we're at today, I think, um, are, are uh, tied to this fact that we cannot imagine otherwise, and we can't imagine otherwise because we don't have a rich enough sense of story. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that we get, and I'm just going to set this up before I get into the story, one of the things that we get through the Western uh, literary imagination is a notion of truth that's tied to epistemology, right? So Plato says this in book 10 of The Republic, he says, poetry is ruinous to those who hear it unless, as an antidote, they have the precise knowledge of the originals, the precise knowledge of the originals, right? And so the Greek word for origin, of course, is archi. We get um, this uh, the precise knowledge so that everything becomes um, secondary to the epistemological project. And through, the, through my work on my dissertation, I became interested in literary traditions that never passed through the school of Aristotle. And I was looking at two primarily. Um, I, did, I ended up doing three years of Jewish studies at Purdue University with Sandra Goodhart um, because, and I became very interested in Jewish ways of reading uh, called Midrash, Midrashic rabbinic ways of reading um, that never passed through the school of Aristotle. And then the other was Native American uh, literature. And in my dissertation, in contrast to this notion of an ontology of truth that Plato sets up, uh, truth which is tied to epistemology, as I noted, and is, and, and is rooted in this appeal to archi, the, origi the original form, um, I, I, termed the, I coined the term ontology of story. Um, and an ontology of story understands that whereas within a platonic Aristotelian ontology of truth, ethics is always secondary to knowledge. It's always a moment within the epistemological. But within an ontology of story, um, the, uh, the epistemological concerns about knowledge are a moment within the ethical. Um, and so you can sort of see if, if, you know, if any of you are familiar with the work of Emmanuel Levinas, um, I became really fascinated by Levinas's notion of ethics as first philosophy and his notion of Midrash. And I began to see some structural parallels between uh, oral, indigenous oral literary traditions uh, and Midrashic uh, rabbinic uh, traditions. Um, which I'm happy to talk more about later on or, or in Q&A. Um, but yeah, so I, I've been thinking for a long time about this relationship between uh, story and social justice. And um, I'll go ahead and start sharing my, my PowerPoint here. Let's see, can folks see that all right? Um, Great, thanks. All right, so, um, so that's a sort of a, a theoretical framework for uh, what I'm gonna talk about tonight, uh, which isn't gonna be so theoretically heavy, don't worry. Um, but I, tonight's presentation will feature some stories uh, which emerge from a blend of memoir, critical theory, and philosophy. And most of this presentation is, like I said before, rooted in my sabbatical research and travels that I undertook during the fall 2019 semester at UAS. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if I was pressed to identify a genre for this presentation, it, it would be uh, autoethnography, as Wim said earlier. Um, and so what is autoethnography, right? So I got, I got two definitions here of autoethnography that I like, and I'll just read them. Um, <clears throat> one says, it is a qualitative research in which an author uses self-reflection and writing to explore anecdotal and personal experience and connect this autobiographical story to wider cultural, political, and social meanings and understandings. Here's another one I like. Autoethnography is an approach to research and writing that seeks to describe and systematically analyze personal experience in order to understand cultural experience. This approach challenges canonical ways of doing research and representing others and treats research as a political, socially just, and socially conscious act. A researcher uses tenets of autobiography and ethnography to do and write autoethnography, thus as a method 
autoethnography is both process and product. And I had, hadn't actually thought to describe my sabbatical research in those terms until I corresponded with Wim. Um, he reached out to me as one of the editors of Peace Chronicle, uh, you know, to, to ask if I would contribute an autoethnographic essay for the journal on my Trail of Tears journal, a journey, and I realized that autoethnography is exactly what I'm doing here. And the coincidence of the personal and the existential with the political and the cultural uh, is one that I usually adopt anyway, and I owe that tendency to some of my graduate professors, uh, including Martin Matustic, who I know Jeff Ferris worked, and, and Sandra Goodhart, uh, both of whom encouraged this braiding of concern in their critical theory and philosophical practice. And for years, I've privileged the vocabulary of genealogy because it offers us not just history, but as Michel Foucault writes, a history of the present. Genealogy is always already storied. It is situated, adopts a perspective, remains open to interpretation, and it's always in a state of becoming. We have our personal genealogies, and we have our cultural and political genealogies. Autoethnography provides a methodology for reading those personal, cultural, and political genealogies through each other, rendering various aspects of our autoethnographic work more or less legible, depending on the apertures through which we focus our attention. And I'm gonna talk more about that at the very end. Uh, that's why I like the second definition of autoethnography as both process and product. We are reminded that every one of us has a story, even as none of us are reducible to our histories. And when we adopt such an approach, we realize that the quality of our relations is, is not, uh, the quality of our relations um, is not uniquely occasioned by what we intend. We can approach our work from intentional consciousness, but we must remain open to that which comes to us from beyond ourselves. We must remain open to revelation, things and relations that do not have their origin within our idiosyncratic intentions. And this was certainly true during our journey on the Trail of Tears, when we experienced uncanny moments of revelation and very strange but beautiful coincidences. As we started out, I, I made a post on Facebook and my friend Louise Brady from the Kixadi clan in Sitka, she wrote, your ancestors are guiding you. And certainly that seemed to be the case because there were too many coincidences for that not to be true. Uh, and so tonight's presentation arrives in two parts. In the first part, we'll describe our, I'll describe our journey on the Trail of Tears <clears throat> by appeal to uh, these twin concerns of autoethnography, genealogy, and cultural political history. <clears throat> and in the second part, I'll return to the question of story and social justice to talk about restorative and decolonial legibility by appeal to two stories that have really had a profound uh, impact on me. And one of them is a Cherokee story, and one of them uh, is a Jewish story. Um, so I think it's uh, worth sort of starting out with with a little bit of, of, of my biography. Um, as a kid, I was raised with so much confidence in my Cherokee identity. Uh, my grandfather raised us to be fiercely proud of being Cherokee. He didn't know a lot of the language uh, because he got kicked out of school in the sixth grade um, when his, uh, one of his brothers beat up the teacher. And uh, this was in this was in ta outside in, in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Um, but one of his brothers was a fluent Cherokee speaker, uh, and uh, his name is uh, Sequoia. But everybody called him Bull. I knew him as Uncle Bull. And when I was 18 years old, after I graduated high school, I was going to go live with my Uncle Bull and learn the language from him. But then he had a stroke and he lost the ability to talk. And I remember talking to my grandpa <clears throat> uh, about this and about how sad it made me and how I didn't want the language to die uh, with his generation because my dad didn't speak it. And all my grandpa knew was handshake language, Tawaja Chooch, you know, things and naughty things he would say in, uh, in Cherokee. And I was talking with him and he asked me, 
I, at this point I was probably about 22 years old. He just said, well, how does it feel to be the last of the damn Mohicans? Um, I didn't think I'd say that out loud and suddenly feel so much emotion. But, um, and you gotta understand that my, um, my uh, grandfather was born in Oklahoma. Uh, he moved in 1950, to, they moved uh, to Central Valley, California, where <clears throat> my dad was born. And my dad, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it was in Lodi, California doing, during the Vietnam War. And you know, his story is that in San Francisco, you had all these radical anti-war protests. In Lodi, California, there were actually pro-Vietnam War protests. And as an 18-year-old at high school, who didn't know what he was going to do. He joined the infantry. He enlisted in the infantry. Uh, and, he went to, and he went to Vietnam. And when he came back, I was born uh, in Colorado. And I, I lived my life as an army brat. Um, and throughout all of this time, you know, my dad was sort of running away from Lodi and he felt that his family, his father had been running away from Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Uh, and through all of this time, he kept telling me, or it's not through the, all this time, but really like at the end of high school in my early twenties, he kept telling me, you got to give it up. You got to give it up. Give up, give up your concern for the Cherokee language, give up your concern for Cherokee culture. Um, and that was, a, you know, I was concerned that the richness of our ancestral and genealogical strength would would silently vanish. Um, and I'll say that to this day, my dad regrets that. He really regrets having ever said that. Um, but because of that is, is you know, uh, my, you know I, I had for various reasons, I had uh, tried, tried college right out of high school, but I had to drop out. Um, when I was 24, I got back into college. I got my own student loans and stuff. And, um, and at that point I was, as I would say, seduced by white supremacy. This was the moment when my dad was telling me, go study, go study Plato, go study Socrates. Now, these are the people you ought to be studying. Go to Europe, go travel Europe. Um, and so I was seduced by white supremacy because you know, you think about it. I mean, uh, as Cornell West says, the university is, is historically a white supremacist institution. Um, but I never left my own private concern for my Cherokee identity. And in fact, when I went to grad school at Purdue University, I got to do the School of Criticism and Theory at Cornell University. I studied with Eric Schaefitz. We did Native American literature and federal Indian law. Uh, my dissertation, like I said, picked up Native American lit. Um, and that was powerful and that was important to me. Uh, I had studied, I started uh, Purdue University in 2004, they, right, and my grandfather died right before, uh, like literally a month before I started classes at Purdue University. My grandfather died. I went to California. I held his hand in the hospital as he died. Um, you know, Purdue University was like the only university I think he knew by name since, you know, he was a kid. My dad used to say, oh yeah, we grew up watching Purdue football. So when I walked into the hospital, he had one of these breathing masks on and through the mask, he said, my grandson's going to Purdue. <laughs> he was so proud of me because um, I'm a I'm first generation college student out of my family. And, um, but you know, I, I, I thought this gave me some good credentials until I went to UAS um, after completing my dissertation. And there on Shingadani, I met a dear friend and colleague of mine, Ishmael Hope, and he gave me a really good admonishment. I taught a class my first summer there called Trickster Hermeneutics. And uh, Ishmael, I invited Ishmael to come tell Raven stories. And he told me, he said, you know, your erudition in Native American lit is fine, but unless you, it's rooted in close proximity with the source material, the oral literary indigenous source material, um, then it doesn't mean that much. And so uh, I, he, uh, Ishmael actually took a couple of my classes and I would drive him home on Tuesdays and we just had some incredibly rich conversations on oral literary tradition, phenomenology, and these kinds of things. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's with all this in mind and, and all of this backstory, which is not an uncommon story. There's so many Cherokee scholars and, and colleagues I have out there who have parallel stories to mine. Um, and you think about this one generation, my dad telling me to give it up. So many indigenous families deal with that. One generation says, give it up. One generation wants to sever it. 
Um, and the joke was, you know, my dad's a baby boomer. And I used to tell my dad, you know, I hate that Fleetwood Mac song, man. You can go your own way. <laughs> it's like, you know, like I get you can go your own way, but I want to be rooted in our ancestral genealogy. That's what I want to, to carry us through. Um, and so that's, that's some backstory here. Um, and then, so this is a map I actually made for my daughter, but I thought I would reuse it here. We ended up going to, um, uh, we, we presented in her classroom our, our trip. And so we just have this line that shows uh, just Juno to, to the, where the Trail of Tears was. We can take a closer look at this map here. Um, and, uh, you know, you can, I don't know how well people can see this, um, but you see all these different trail, trails of tears. Um, there are many different routes. Um, and we started uh, here near Dahlonega, Georgia. Dahlonega is where my ancestors, Cherokee ancestors lived before their land was stolen from them um, in 1832 during the first gold rush in the United States. Uh, the word Dahlonega is a Cherokee word. It's the word that means gold. It also means uh, yellow. Um, and and uh, the official Trail of Tears went from 1838 to 1839. But just to give some, some backstory here, um, I'm not sure if I, okay. Uh, but to give some backstory here, um, the, uh, in, in 1828, the state of Georgia made it illegal for um, Cherokees to congregate within the state of Georgia, except for one reason. Cherokees were allowed to congregate in order to cede land to the state of Georgia. But other than that, um, the Cherokees were not allowed to meet at all. In 1830, uh, Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act and, ate and promised uh, the state of Georgia that he would get rid of all of the Cherokees. In um, 1832, right before 1832, gold was discovered, the first gold rush in the United States. And uh, my ancestors lost their land in uh, the sixth lottery um, that, that stole the land and then gave it out to prospectors uh, by lottery. And so technically, uh, my direct ancestors are called old settlers because they arrived to Indian country, what is today Oklahoma, before the official trail of tears of 1838 to 1839. However, David Cornsilk uh, writes this, this uh, he writes, for many, the Trail of Tears includes all migrations west. Uh, and in this case, he's talking about uh, a woman named Elizabeth Terrell. And he says, Elizabeth Terrell was an old settler who came west before the event we officially know as the Trail of Tears. That does not lessen her anguish at leaving her ancestors and beloved homeland behind and certainly makes her journey a personal Trail of Tears. And uh, I, I love that quotation because uh, I can trace my Cherokee ancestors back to nine generations or through nine generations. Um, and I'll just share some of this genealogy real quick. Um, you know, if you, if you look at this slide here on the right, you have, uh, there's, there's my daughter, Mila, there's my father, uh, George, and there's me. And this is a photograph of the three of us we took uh, at the end of the trail. Then there's my grandfather, uh, Lucian Neely and my grandmother. His mother uh, was Biddy Alley. Um, and uh, she was the daughter of Andrew Jack Robertson, who everybody called Uncle Jack. Uh, everybody called Uncle Jack. Um, and then his mother was Nancy Terrell. Now, Andrew, his name was Andrew Jackson Robertson. Nobody in my family knows why he was named Andrew Jackson Robertson. But the name sticks <clears throat> in part because um, Robertson is, a, or sorry, Jackson is a middle name uh, that I have. It's my father's middle name, um, but that's, it's still a big mystery how he got that name. But he was the first generation born in Oklahoma or Indian country uh, after the Trail of Tears. And then his mother, Nancy Terrell, her mother, Elizabeth Terrell Kwawetla, and her mother, Leitoti, those are my great-great-grandmothers who were all born in, um, Georgia and uh, had their land stolen from them. They migrated in 1832, but a great, great, great uncle of mine, 
and a great, great, great aunt of mine, they stayed behind uh, in Georgia and they eventually were forced on the official uh, Trail of Tears. Um, and, and, you know, so if, if we look at this real quick, uh, there's some interesting stories I've, I've learned in my genealogy. Uh, first of all, my five times great grandmother, Le Toti, uh, as you can see, she was born about 1765 in Cherokee Nation East, and she died 1832 in Cherokee Nation uh, Indian Territory, what's today Oklahoma. Um, and you see the date she died, 1832. That's, that's the year they arrived uh, near Tahlequah. And so she barely survived the forced removal. Um, and, I, and I found some interesting research in 1889, the federal government published uh, through the uh, Bureau of American Ethnography, a manuscript that shows that my five times great grandmother was the first Cherokee to convert to Christianity, uh, which, is, which is pretty wild. Uh, and then my four times great grandmother, Kwawatla, was her Cherokee name, but she came to be known as Elizabeth Trail, and that's the person that David Cornsook was just was talking about. Now, this is this is phenomenal to me. This just happened um, in uh, last month, actually. Um, I woke up, and my eyes are blurry, and I'm sort of trying to wake up, and I read that passage from David Cornsook about. On, on one of these private Facebook groups the Cherokee Nation has. And, um, and I read this, for many of the Trail of Tears includes all migrations west. Elizabeth Terrell was an old settler who came west before. And I'm reading that and I see her picture. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's my, that's my four times great grandmother, what? And I had this picture hanging on my office at UAS. So I saw it every single day I was on campus. And lo and behold, it turns out that there's a, a, a magazine out of Oklahoma called the Bartlesville uh, Monthly. And my four times great grandmother was, ta-da, on the cover. <laughs> Looking like a Cherokee supermodel. <laughs> a Cherokee cover girl, right? <laughs> uh, so that just completely blew my mind. And I right away, I, I contacted the publishers of the magazine and I said, that's my great, 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 great grandmother. And uh, so they, uh, they, they told me that David Cornstell gave them the, um, gave them the, uh, uh, the, the, the image. Um, and so, yeah, all, all of that's fascinating uh, genealogy. And then my uh, great, great grandfather, uh, Andrew Jackson Robertson, he was the first born after the Trail of Tears. Um, and I got this lovely obituary, a, a facsimile of a, an obituary um, that talks about his accomplishments. He was, he, he really helped rebuild the Cherokee Nation. He helped make the bricks that uh, were used to develop the Cherokee National Courthouse, which is now, uh, it's, it's the, one of the architectural gems of Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Um, and then I got, I got his actually portrait painted by a famous Cherokee artist named George Cochran hanging behind me uh, as well. So I, I feel like that, that they're always uh, with me. Um, yeah, there's some, uh, there's a historical timeline I already sort of have mentioned, um, but I'll get into to some of, of um, the journey here, the, the trail. Um, we started our journey, uh, like I said, in Dahlonega, um, which was the, uh, we went for, first they went from Dahlonega to, to New Echota. Um, and New Echota, so Dahlonega was, the area where my ancestors were. Um, but then New Echota served as the Cherokee capital from 1825 to 1835. Uh, and it's a beautiful place. Uh, it, it was a, a, a vibrant little town, as you probably know, uh, the, you know, Cherokees, you know, we, we really work to assimilate um, as, a, as, a, as a modality of survival. Uh, with the onslaught of, of settler colonialism. And because of that, uh, New Echota adopted a lot of, of these features. It had a two-story council house. It had the Supreme Court there. It had a print shop. And it was home of the Cherokee Phoenix starting in 1828. So Sequoia, the genius he was, invented the Cherokee syllabary and uh, revealed it in 1821 through the help of his young daughter, which my daughter, there she is in, in the image, um, loves the story of how Sequoia's daughter was one of the key people who helped spread the use of the syllabary. But in 1828, um, the Cherokee Phoenix was started in New Echota 
Georgia, and it was the first bilingual, it's the first indigenous newspaper in the United States, and it was bilingual. Um, and it was, uh, it was, it was edited by uh, Elias Boudinot and Samuel Worcester. And um, uh, th there's, a, there's a lot to say there about Elias uh, Boudinot, but I'll, I'll refrain for a moment. Um, but as we were walking through uh, New Echota, Georgia in the, in the streets of the capital, we were the only one there. And it was just an amazing experience to be the only one there. Uh, many people say that the Trail of Tears started in New Echota because Elias Boudinot and Major Ridge and John Ridge, uh, these were three uh, uh, folks who signed what became called, uh, what, what was known as the Treaty of New Echota. Um, and that was a very small group of people uh, called the Treaty Party. They came to be known as the Treaty Party. And basically they were Cherokee leaders, but um, they ended up signing this treaty that made, they, they gave the legal foundation for the Trail of Tears to happen. So uh, Elias Boudinot, Major Ridge, John Ridge, they signed the Treaty of New Echota saying that the Cherokee would relocate to Indian territory. Um, they had two years to, to, to make this move. And um, so some folks think it, it landed there. It's huge, it basically created a, a Cherokee civil war, um, which, you know, I mean, it, it still has its effects today in the Cherokee nation. Um, but it traded, that treaty traded land for land west of the Mississippi. It got provisions for making the move. It was, it promised sovereignty in the new territory. And for those of you who may know, you know, in the last couple of years, the Cherokee Nation has got um, representation in the House of Representatives. And that was made possible. That was actually promised in the Treaty of, of New, New Echota. Um, but from Dahlonega and New Echota then, um, we went to, uh, uh, Chief John Ross House. Um, so if if the uh, treaty party headed up sort of by Lydus Boudinot, Major Ridge, and John Ridge, they were one small faction of the Cherokee Nation at the time. Uh, John Ross, who was principal chief, was the other major faction. Uh, most 90-something percent of Cherokee people uh, resisted the treaty, treaty of New Echota, but it was ratified in the U.S. Congress by a single vote. Uh, but we stopped off here at his house, uh, the Chief John Ross house. It was, the, um, it, it was a really wonderful moment because we showed up to the house and it was locked down. Nobody was there, but there was a phone number I found online and I called the phone number and right away within five minutes, the care uh, carekeeper came down and he opened everything up for us. And we spent the whole afternoon at Chief John Ross's house and, uh, and just getting this in, in immense oral history from the, uh, the person who, who keeps the grounds there. Um, and uh, my, my daughter who loves archery, one of the things she got into, one of the things that she was really excited about was she actually got to hold Chief John Ross's longbow. Um, and that was, that was a pretty cool thing. And then of course, while we were here as well, uh, the care uh, keeper told a lot of story about the Civil War in that area and the history of Cherokees with the Civil War. And my dad, as I, oh, there's the longbow right there. That's the longbow that uh, Mila got to hold. And um, that my dad is a retired army officer found the discussions on um, uh, the, the Civil War and the Cherokee relationship with the Civil War, which was fraught with, with, with uh, man, that's a whole lot of history there. Um, but yeah, so that was intense. I'm gonna keep going here. Um, and then one of the coolest places we stopped off after that was Red Clay State Park. And uh, all of us really agree that this was one of the most special moments of the trip. This was the, the place where um, the uh, Cherokee Nation held its last tribal council before removal. And it was just over the border of Georgia into Tennessee because you remember I told you in 1828, the state of Georgia made it illegal for anyone to congregate. <clears throat> and so they did it just over the border. And what was so special about this place, <clears throat> if you see the um, video there, the reason um, that um, Cherokee people picked this place as the site of its last tribal council was in part because of its proximity to this sacred spring called the Blue Hole. And um, we showed up and uh, we told the National Park Ranger there 
uh, who we were and what we were doing. And she was extraordinarily kind. And um, of course, I knew the Sacred Spring was here, but right away she offered to open it up to us. And it was incredible. We got to sort of, I called it our Cherokee baptism. Uh, we got to get in and, and uh, sort of wash ourselves and, and clean ourselves. And, um, and, and Aaron was the, the ranger's name. She told us that she uh, never opens that place up except for Cherokee people. And that uh, she'd been there for like 14 years and only twice has she ever arrested anybody. And both times was because they tried to get over that fence there and, and get into the springs themselves. So we really appreciated um, th that opportunity. It was a really kind of a holy experience. And then um, also here at Red Clay State Park is the eternal flame uh, because all three, you know, if you don't know, there's three federally recognized Cherokee nations. There's the EBCI or the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. There's the um, Cherokee Nation, which I'm a citizen of. And then there's the UKB, the United Gadua Band, uh, which is also headquartered out of Tahlequah, Oklahoma. But they met together in 1984 for the first time since the Trail of Tears. And they started there the eternal flame, uh, which burns uh, still. Um, and uh, so that, that, that was a really, really special place. After uh, Red Clay State Park, we went to probably one of the, the, the most sacred destinations on our spot, and that was Waffle House. Uh, <laughs> you gotta understand, if you're in the South, there are Waffle Houses everywhere. And my daughter was born and raised in Alaska, and she'd never in her life seen a Waffle House. And so my dad and I, we're gonna take you to Waffle House. And so uh, at, at the end of that day, we went to Waffle House. <laughs> Little joke. <laughs> um, yeah, but then we kept going uh, and we visited Fort Cass in the Hawassi River and Nancy Ward's grave. And uh, all of this is in Tennessee. And this was a really difficult day for us for a couple of reasons. Um, one, because Fort Cass became the ground zero for uh, the concentration camps that were used to uh, uh, imprison the Cherokees before removal. Fort Cass measured, it doesn't exist anymore, but it measured six miles wide and 10 miles long, and it housed thousands of Cherokees. And um, I heard estimates of up some close to 2,000 Cherokee people died in Fort Cass um, uh, concentration camp before the removal even started. Um, and, uh, and, and there's nothing around here. There's no, in this whole area, there's, there's no memorials. Um, there's no signs. There's no interpretive signs. Um, you know, you, you get these little Trail of Tears original route signs, but there's no, there's no place to go. And in fact, one of the big places is called Rattlesnake Springs, well, actually, in this picture right here, you see the Hawassi River Heritage Center. I'm about to come, I'm about to, come uh, to that in my story here. Um, but otherwise, we, um, we, uh, we drove around. Like Rattlesnake Springs was one of these places uh, that was so important to Cherokee history in terms of the removal. And you couldn't get to it because it was all farmland. It was all private farmland. Beautiful, of course, rolling hills with farmhouses and farmland, but it was all off limits to us all private property, no trespassing, um, and, and, and churches, farmland and churches. It's all it was. And, uh, but we did find this uh, Hawassi um, River Heritage Center, and we went in there, and that was the other difficult moment for us because the woman who ran it uh, claimed Cherokee ancestry, um, but I'm sure that's debatable. Um, certainly none of the three federally recognized nations would um, uh, claim her as Cherokee, um, but she, she just made this awful um, claim that the Trail of Tears was not as bad as everybody makes it out to be. She said, in fact, it's not as bad as the media would like to tell you. And then, of course, you know, when you hear people talk about the media, um, that sense sets off, you know, triggers about political ideology and political leaning and these kinds of things. Um, but it was an awful thing to say. And she said that uh, there were some Cherokees, in fact, when they passed through like Missouri, it reminded them so much of their ancestral lands that they just broke off and settled there. That's all lies, that's all lies. And in fact, they, they, but they're convenient lies for so-called wannabes. 
uh, who can say, yeah, my ancestors, I'm Cherokee, my ancestors, they broke away from the Trail of Tears and these kinds of things. That stuff didn't happen. Um, it, it didn't happen like, like uh, they say. The Cherokee people are the most documented people in world history. We have so many roles, so many rosters. Um, to say that somehow my Cherokee ancestors escaped you know, uh, any of the roles or registers, um, that, that's a, a tremendously unlikely possibility. Um, and then, and then that day we had Nancy Ward's grave. You can see the sign that says, High Priestess of the Cherokees and always loyal friend of white settlers is buried on the ridge to the west. Uh, she repeatedly prevented massacres of white settlers and several times rescued captives from death at the hands of her people. Uh, she's also credited with the introduction of milk cows and many improvements in homemaking into the Cherokee economy. Well, this is a memorial put up at her grave site by the uh, Daughters of the American uh, Revolution. Um, and it's, it's highly problematic. Uh, and, and, the, and one of the reasons why you get this notion of the Cherokee princess, if you've, if you've heard that, you know, there was no such thing as Cherokee princesses. But when the settler co uh, colonists came over, uh, what they found was that uh, Cherokee people, our Cherokee culture, had a profound respect for women. I mean, women could serve uh, as Nancy Ward was one of these, uh, was a beloved woman. Um, they, they had their own council and a beloved woman like Nancy Ward, and there's her grave right there, could overturn any decision made by, um, you know, every, every Cherokee village had a peace chief and a war chief. And if the peace chiefs uh, decided to go to war, the beloved woman uh, could overturn that decision. Um, and of course, Cherokee culture is a matrilineal culture. So all of our clan identification came through uh, the, the maternal line, property was held by uh, the women, the farmland, the agriculture, all that was, was held by women. Um, and women would show up uh, throughout the 18th century to uh, be part of treaty negotiations with the government. And so uh, for the, the, the colonists, they thought that they, they, they called us a petticoat government and they said that, um, that uh, the Cherokee women were treated like royalty, right? Of course, because of the misogynistic, uh, patriarchal culture of, of the settler colonists. Um, but uh, so that's, that, that, was a, that was all part of the very difficult day for us because we just dealt with, with um, misinformation, revisionist history, uh, and things like that. But then our next destination was Cherokee, North Carolina. We actually veered off a little bit so at this point, we broke away from the Trail of Tears to go to Cherokee, North Carolina. Um, I mentioned I was an Army brat. What's interesting about that is uh, from the ages of three until 18, uh, I graduated high school the same month my dad retired from the Army. Uh, I spent my whole entire childhood in Southeast United States. My friends who were military brats were going to Germany, they were going to South Korea, they were going all over the place, but for some reason, um, my entire childhood was spent in the Southeast United States. So I grew up going to the Smoky Mountains, camping there, boating in there. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was, it's kind of a neat coincidence. My dad th thought it was really cool when we were talking about, um, you know, uh, the way that um, we spent our entire life within or within 200 miles of traditional ancestral uh, Cherokee land. Um, and then from, we spent some good time in Cherokee, and then we got back onto the Trail of Tears, and we uh, ended up um, at uh, Blythe Ferry. Now, Blythe Ferry, it was the first memorial. Right here, you can see it. It's the first memorial that gave seed to the National Park Service recreating um, the National Park Trail, the Trail of Tears. Um, it's, a, it's, it's probably the best, most comprehensive memorial that we encountered uh, here. Yeah, during forced migration, the forced removal happened. The first big obstacle for the over the land removal was the Tennessee River, and so uh, the Cherokees were forced here. In in um, I think it's like twelve different regiments. They were broken up into like twelve different regiments passed through here. So two thirds of all Cherokees who were on the Trail of Tears passed through Blythe Ferry. Many of them died here because the river was low and the winter was uh, brutal, and um, it iced over. And, um, uh, but, and, and what I like about uh, the Blythe Ferry Memorial uh, is that it's the first memorial that specifically invoked the language and the vocabulary of ethnic cleansing. Um, so I'm sort of moving through this fast, but I, I just wanted to get a, a picture of this dedication here of the memorial. It says, 
This memorial is dedicated to the Cherokees that died and those that cried due to their forced removal, which has become known as the Trail of Tears. Today, we are champions of human rights and oppose ethnic cleansing. What happened to native peoples of North America should not be forgotten. Um, and I think that's powerful because all these other memorials, of course, use the vocabulary of genocide, but this was the first one that specifically used ethnic cleansing. And it was a real sobering uh, moment for us. Uh, and then we headed on uh, down and um, I thought I would show this, this uh, brief video real quick because up until this point, we had been traveling the original route of the Trail of Tears. Um, and then we ended up at Falls Creek Falls State Park. And I knew that there was something related to the Trail of Tears there, but I wasn't quite sure exactly what it was. And when we showed up to Falls Creek Falls State Park, we asked a bunch of people, nobody knew anything. But uh, some of the employees there went and got two park rangers for us and the two park rangers showed up and they, we told them our story, what we were doing. And they told us about this land that, um, that, the, that, that the park had just purchased. And this was part of the original Trail of Tears. Um, and I'll just, let me see if I can play this real quick for you. All right, so this is a really interesting part of our trip because so far- Can you hear it? We uh, began in Dahlonega, Georgia where our ancestors were. And then we went over uh, to Red Clay State Park. Um, and then we uh, headed over to Cherokee, North Carolina. Coming out of Cherokee, North Carolina, uh, our first stop was Falls Creek Falls State Park. We're following the route that the Remember the Removal Bike Riders uh, take. When we got to uh, the Falls Creek Falls Park, we talked to a couple park rangers because there's not a lot of literature on the Trail of Tears in this area. It's not in Barbara Duncan's book. And uh, no, nobody other than the rangers at the park knew what we were talking about. But the rangers told us they just acquired this land and they gave us directions uh, to get here. And the whole trip, we've been following sections of the original Trail of Tears, but that's been on paved road. Um, so we encounter these signs that say original route. We're driving on it at 45, 50 miles per hour. Can I see? But here we are. Here we are. Um, Mila, you want to tell us where we're at? Yeah. Come over here. We are at. You got to face the camera so they can hear you. We're at the original route, and it's not paved down. And over there, there are wagon lots from where the route. Wagon here. So you can see, that's right, Neil, thank you. You can see, here's a rut. It's all the way down in here. So here's a wagon train. And then the ranger said that uh, because it got so muddy, they had to shift over. So here's another lane. And it's coming down right down here it's all over ground up it's right here you can see it it's the rut and there's a third one over here i think i see a fourth one over there all right one two three I think what we're at is four lanes of the absolute original northern route of the Trail of Tears. Like, that's where we're at right now. And we ought to do some detective work to get it. I wonder if they remember the removal riders come through here. The ranger said he was going to, that the park um, was going to do something with this, but they don't know what to do yet. Um, there's farmland over there. I wonder how far down we could go. So uh, that was a, a really intense moment. <clears throat> and then later on, as we got through Missouri, we encountered other areas of the Trail of Tears, uh, the original Trail of Tears that have been preserved much better. Like nobody, like the, as the ranger said, 
there's nothing here. Um, but then we actually walked parts of the original Trail of Tears uh, all through Missouri um, and, uh, and on into Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Oops, sorry, there we go. Um, yeah, and then uh, <clears throat> what happened was we um, ended up in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Uh, and these are images taken from inside of what is now the Cherokee Nation Hist Historical Museum uh, in the building that my great-great-grandfather made the bricks for. Um, and we spent some time in Tahlequah visiting family and uh, going to lots of graves where the, my, our uh, ancestors are buried. Um, and something phenomenal happened. Uh, this is why it feels like our ancestors guided us. We went to go look for the grave of my four times great grandmother, Kwawach. Uh, we had the grave site and it was in Stillwell, Oklahoma. And so we started down the road uh, there and that's Ten Killer Lake. We camped at Ten Killer Lake. I used to play at Ten Killer Lake as a kid. And um, on the way there, we see this sign that says the end of the trail. And we're like, what? Put the brakes on, turn around, go follow that sign. And we ended up at uh, one of the disbandment camps. And it was such a phenomenal moment because we didn't know about that disbandment camp. We went looking for my four times great grandmother's grave. And uh, on the way there, we found it. And so we literally, literally it brought us to the very end of the trail. And uh, yeah, that's the sign, end of the trail. That's the sign that we saw. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> we ended up coming around from the very beginning to where our ancestors lived and had their land stolen from them to the very end of the Trail of Tears. It was a really phenomenal uh, experience. <clears throat> um, that's the cemetery there. Um, so I, I, I wanna end with a, another story here and <clears throat> actually two quick stories and I, I'm mindful of time here. I apologize if I'm going on too long, um, but there's two stories I want to I want to share these and so the first one is a Cherokee story uh, and it's told by Freeman Al and uh, I'm, I'm just going to read it briefly out of this book edited by Barbara Duncan the origin of the Milky Way Barbara Duncan has been such a good friend uh, and and, and um, so so knowledgeable um, but this story uh, she tells me takes place at Klingman's Dome uh, Kuwahi which is the Cherokee word for this area. Today it's called Klingman's Dome. It's the highest point on the Appalachian Trail. Um, and so I actually, I tried to find the video. I, I, my dad and, and my daughter and I, we broke off the, the main path there and I read this story out loud, but I can't find that video. So I'm gonna read it uh, real quick to you all. It's called People Singing in the Earth. Long before the tragedies of the people happened, the Cherokees were sitting in a council house you can imagine this big building sitting on top of a mound with thousands of seats inside. And they're all gathered in the middle of winter and there's a big fire crackling in the middle of the council. And the chiefs are all gathered in the center at the bottom and the people are listening, listening to the oral history being told or to the business being discussed. When all of a sudden, with no wind whatsoever outside, the bearskin on the council house opens up wide enough for a person to come through and then it sort of folds back and then all of a sudden drops back into place. The Cherokee, being very spiritual as they were in those days, realized that someone, some spirit had entered the council house. So they sat very quietly and sure enough, up in the corner of the council house, they began to see a light, a sort of greenish colored light materialized and it soon turned into a person they knew this person was a Cherokee, but they didn't know who he was. He came down to where the chiefs were sitting and he said, you, my brothers and sisters must follow me for out of the East will come a group of people who will destroy your homes and your villages will be burned and your children will be killed and your homeland will be taken away and never again will you be happy. And so the Cherokee said, no, we can't leave because this land belonged to our mothers, mothers, mothers. He said, I'll be back in seven days and you must fast and decide whether you'll go with me or stay here and suffer. In seven days, he came back again. 
and half of the people had decided to follow him, half had decided to stay home. And so when he came, the half that followed him went up toward the mountain, the sacred mountain of the Cherokee, which is today called Klingman's Dome. And he got to this great massive rock cliff and he touched it with his hand and the whole cliff opened up. And you could hear people singing and laughing inside the mountain. And a stairwell leading up to a beautiful land of springtime and summer. And the people began to march in with the butterflies flying and the fruit trees bearing fruit. And the people were all happy. One man at the end decided that he had left his family there in the village. And he wanted to go back and get them and bring them to this beautiful land. So he rushed back to the village and headed back to the mountain. And when he got back to the mountain with his family, the mountain had closed up. And they said he was crazy, and they left him there alone. He stayed there for seven days, and on the seventh day, he began to hear the singing deep within the earth. And so he went back to the village. And from that day forward, he told the people in the village that if you're quiet enough, long enough, and if you sit and listen to the streams and really are aware and very quiet and still, that you too can hear the people singing within the earth those happy ones that went on before. And sure enough, the settlers came and they began to burn the villages and take away the land. And the Cherokee people have been searching for that happiness they had long, long ago. And I think the teaching of this story, <clears throat> not only was the fact there was a revelation of what was about to happen, people losing their homeland on the trail of tears and so on, but also to teach us that we should never let the child disappear from us. You remember when you were a child, when you would take off your shoes and prod through the mud puddles and laugh and sing? Remember when you were a child that not a butterfly passed that you didn't see it and chase it, and not an animal or an insect were overlooked, and that you were so close to nature and so close to Mother Earth that those were the things that were important to you. We should remain like children and sometimes take our shoes off and prod through the mud puddles and sit by the streams and listen to the talking of the streams and the whispers of the wind. We must preserve the earth and we must value the lives of our elders and the lives of our children and save them a place to live. If we don't, then there will be a revelation for the people of today as well as for all of the Cherokee. And I love that story for a couple of reasons. One, because my daughter was on the trail of tears with us and she loved the butterflies. I actually have a video of her at Klingman's Dome here. And I asked her, what is different about this place than Shingadani in Alaska where we were living? And she says, there's more butterflies here. And when we were at the Sacred Springs, the Blue Hole at Red Clay State Park, uh, we got out of the Sacred Spring and a butterfly landed on my daughter's hand. And she just loved that so much. So the coincidence of these stories is amazing. But also because um, last summer, uh, two summers ago, the summer of 2019, I was teaching at, uh, at the Outer Coast Summer Seminar in Sitka, Alaska. And um, this is when our, our, our governor started just to wage war on our economy and our university. And I felt myself full, so full of anger um, because I worked so hard to, to get to where I was at that point. And this governor was just gonna come through and destroy everything. And, um, and he was a friend of Donald Trump who has the portrait of Andrew Jackson in his portrait. And I didn't want that anger to become hatred. I really did not want that anger to become hatred in me, but I felt it becoming hatred. And so I went down to the Kastahin, the, what is called uh, the Indian River in Sitka. And I sat there and I meditated and I meditated and I thought about this story and I just listened. And it is as if, you can hear the people singing in the earth. As if I could hear my grandfather calling to me, you know, helping me, get, helping me heal through that hatred uh, that was beginning to, to, to form uh, in me. And it's not a hearing that you hear with your ears, it's a hearing with your body. This is why I love phenomenology so much, because you hear this with your body. And, you know, since Rene Descartes, you know, settler colonial society doesn't have that relationship with the body anymore. Um, and uh, so that's, that, there's a couple reasons why I love that. Um, and then there's, there's one more story I want to conclude with, and it's, it's the Jewish story I was talking about, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just tell it uh, briefly since we're running out of time. 
but it, it comes from Emmanuel Levinas, who publishes it in one of his books uh, called Nine Talmudic Readings, and he titles it The Temptation of Temptations. And in it, you hear the story of the Jewish people who are wandering through the desert and they come to the promised land. And there's this moment when God grabs a mountain and he picks it up and turns it over their heads like a tub is what it reads. And God says, you know, accept the covenant or here you will die. And, uh, and you know, it's fascinating because it's, it's not like an angry God or anything. It's, it's very much this idea as I've come to understand it through my Jewish teachers, it's very much this idea that, you know, this is the way to live. You, you, you accept the covenant. This is the way you will live and this is the way that you will survive. Uh, it's protocol and it's ceremony. And, um, and uh, the Jews, it is said in this, in this piece, they committed to doing it. They committed to it before they even heard the terms of the covenant. They committed to a doing before a hearing. And Levinas makes a lot out of this because he says in the Socratic tradition of Western philosophical tradition, we don't do uh, before hearing. We insist on hearing first the terms of that covenant and then decide whether or not we want to do it. And this is so common when you talk about decolonizing the university or decolonizing our institutions, even at UAS where I was with the 20% Alaska Native student body, non-Indigenous faculty constantly want to say, well, decolonize, decolonize, tell us what that means, tell us what that means. And my response was to tell this story and to say what Levinas finds so beautiful about this story is not only did the Jews at that moment commit to a doing before hearing, but they understood that one must do in order to hear. And in the same ways, you have to commit to a doing before you can hear what decolonizing entails. That's how it becomes legible. And, uh, you know, I think about uh, Joy Harjo who says, uh, I do not know your language, but I hear the sounds of vowels breaking through the waves. And uh, when I first started my Clinket language courses, uh, the first thing you learn are, are the vowels. And uh, in Klinkic, and very similar in Cherokee, uh, when you, you don't ask somebody, well, in English, we would say, do you speak Klinkit? But in Klinkit, the word means, do you hear Klinkit? The question is, do you hear Klinkit? And it's a repetitive verb, so it's, do you repeatedly hear Klinkit? And so I think, I think that's, that's the powerful aspect of what I call an ontology of story, which is indexed to what Levinas calls a consciousness of hearing. These are just fundamentally different starting points than we've inherited from settler colonial uh, philosophical traditions. Um, so I'll, I'll end it there and I, I apologize if I, I went too late, but we have at least 10 minutes for questions and I'm happy to hang out uh, and talk more. Saul, I love you, man. I just like, I moved in so many ways and my heart is so warm and um, I don't know, the celebration of love that is telling our stories. Um, I guess we should just invite everybody to our post um, session uh, happy hour or lyceum or whatever that we would have so that um, those who have questions that don't get answered by half past the hour um, could have the opportunity to do so. Um, so in, in that good faith, um, the, the people who um, have questions, you know, um, I don't feel like I necessarily want to read somebody's message from the chat. So um, I think we can set it so that you can just unmute yourself and you can ask a question. So while everybody else is getting set up, um, let me just ask you, um, in what ways do you feel like you were able to actually decolonize the trail, if not for everyone, for yourself? Um, well, so, you know, I'm going to write in 1500 words about this for uh, the Peace Chronicle, right? And um, Wim invited me to do it, but all this crazy stuff was happening in Alaska. And he said, well, why don't you save it actually for an upcoming issue on healing? Uh, and so I really think that th the healing is what mattered the most. The healing has is, is been so incredible across generations um, because, you know, my dad went from give it up in my early 20s to indifference uh, in my 30s as I was uh, finishing up grad school 
uh, to at this point understanding that our story is precisely what makes us Cherokee. I mean, it, you know, I, my, my good friend Ernestine Hayes, a Clinkett writer, she was the writer laureate for State of Alaska from 2016 to 2018. Um, I, rec I recommend two of her books, uh, Blonde Indian and The Tao of Raven. Um, but she used to say the same thing to me. She's like, I used to feel like I wasn't Clinkett enough or I wasn't indigenous enough, indigenous enough um, because of what happened to our family, because of this generation in which everything sort of uh, gets disconnected. But then she said, but then I realized it's exactly what makes me indigenous in the United States. And I think my dad was able to, to come to terms with that. And now he is so proud. And uh, his cousin, uh, my cousin Ellen, who I love, his favorite cousin, she's in her 70s and she's taking Cherokee language classes uh, with me now. Um, my daughter's taking Cherokee language classes with me. Um, and we've just really restored uh, the family in this work and the family is so grateful for this this work that that um that i kind of inaugurated right i mean the the, the great thing you know cherokee people we're, we're fire keepers that's the thing we're fire keepers um one of our early word terms for ourselves was was keepers of the fire um and the fire was so important you know we we we, we got to visit i didn't get put it on the slide there but I got, we got to visit um the gadua mound which is the mother town uh for all Cherokee people, all Cherokee people. And this is right outside Cherokee, North Carolina. And it's now owned again by the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. But for uh, a long time, it was farmland and the mount, the sacred mound was bulldozed and raised and all of this stuff. But, um, but, but we got to go there and it was that this Gadua mound held our fire, our sacred fire, so that all of the surrounding villages once a year they would extinguish their council house fires and they would come to Gadua to re reignite their fire. Um, and uh, I've been told that they've done some sort of geological testing on the Gadua mound and the fire that we kept there burned for so long and it burned for so hot, it magnetized the earth. It's left its indelible imprint um, on the land. And so I just really love this metaphor about keeping a fire. Uh, and I, I, that's what we're doing, you know, so my, I, I tell my I tell my daughter all the time. I said I tell her about the the talk I had with my grandpa when he said, "How does it feel to be the last of the damn Mohicans?" And uh, and when she speaks Cherokee to me, um, it's just it's the most beautiful thing. And uh, we're keeping the fire. So I, I I think that's that's probably the biggest thing. And it, it, in response to your question, Wim. Uh, has very little to do with academia, more to do with genealogy. <clears throat> I can go if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, so that was very interesting. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Uh, really touching as well to listen to you, especially to see it also from your daughter's eyes. You know, it really makes a big difference to see um, the younger ones, you know, kind of like looking back in that sense. Um, my question is, I, I do a lot of work on decolonization, so I'm really fascinated whenever every time you, you get there or you make a reference to it. Um, and I was reading something else that you had uh, written, spoken about, and uh, you talked about decolonial justice. And I was wondering if it was possible in the context of this story that you were telling us, for you to uh, define it for yourself, like what do you mean by decolonial justice? And also, uh, you know, is that something that we can use in a way to talk about uh, what the BLM movement is today? Because I'm, I'm trying to make those links for my students and I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, I, absolutely, I, I think so. Um, when, I, when I think about decolonial justice, there's, there's such a genealogy of influence there um, and, you know, the folks who I'm really tied to in thinking about this um, sort of begin, you know, with like uh, the work of Enrique Dussel, who was reading Emmanuel Levinas. Um, and, you know, I, sorry to point out Jeff again, but, you know, talking about the Zapatistas, right, uh, back in the day. And, um, but, you know, and then Nelson Maldonado Torres, Walter Mignolo, uh, Eduardo Mendieta, 
uh, and these folks who really talk about the difference, so much of their work hinges on the difference between decoloniality and, and uh, uh, decolonization. Sorry, I had to look at the window. My family is getting back right now. Uh, they had to go to Seattle for medical uh, uh, issues. Um, so they're about to roll in the front door. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sitting in my office, um, but you'll get to meet my daughter. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, it, it what I think that in the field of like post-colonial studies, um, hold on, I actually got to unlock the door. <laughs> hold on. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you. Hey, um, okay. <laughs> Um, sorry, my daughter just said, I got to pee and ran. <laughs> um, okay, where was I? But thinking about um, decolonial justice, you know, when you look at like post-colonial studies, traditionally speaking, there's never anything to do with um, indigenous people of Turtle Island or North America. And um, I think that we're doing some good work there, but I love this distinction between colonialism and coloniality. Right, so when Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang published their manifesto, decolonization is not a metaphor, it's about land back, right? It's about real political processing. I absolutely 100% agree with all of that. But what I find so valuable about coloniality as opposed to colonialism is that it's the song that lives on long after the instrument is gone, right? Um, and we know that in North America, in the United States and Canada, there's nothing post about colonialism at all. There's nothing post about colonialism in the United States. And in fact, talking to Wim last night, you know, I told him, um, you know, that, that there's actually a starting point that I think we need to adopt. I didn't really articulate it. Originally, I was going to include that in this talk, but instead I thought I decided to end with people singing in the earth. But um, I, th there's, there's, a, um, there's a truth that we haven't come to terms with yet with uh, in, this, in this country. And I actually get this from Foucault, who gave a series of lectures published as Society Must Be Defended. And in, that, in those lectures, he makes this really provocative thesis that he's right on target with. And that is that the state is not born with the cessation of war, but it's codified in the mud and blood of war. And you know, you can look at the US Constitution, you can, I mean, things like the Three-Fifths Compromise Clause, you know, um, things like uh, apartheid Jim Crow laws in the United States. So, you know, we've got that connection with uh, Black Lives Matters and the vicious legacies of white supremacy, um, but also the whole entire history of federal Indian law, right? Uh, and, and so when we're talking about decolonizing, we're talking about decolonial justice, I think one, we got to remember, we, we can't adopt peace as our starting point. And, 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 and I, said this, I said this recently at a talk, or actually it, during a Q&A during a talk, um, it was somebody else's talk, I asked this question and I was misinterpreted. So I'm not saying, right, in, in front of the Peace and Justice Studies Association, I'm not saying that we have to take a footing, a war footing in, in our struggles for decoloniality. I'm saying the war precedes us, right? We're, we start in the middle of war, in the wake of the catastrophic, the disasters. We're not starting from peace. That was the problem with Plato, Plato's Republic, right? Plato's Republic it, it starts out of nowhere out of this impossible fantasy of peace. They just lost the Peloponnesian War. The Spartans had killed 5,000 of their greatest you know, men. It was in the concrete wake of war and devastation that he articulates Plato's Republic. Um, so I, I think that's where we need to, to um, uh, uh, head out. And uh, or that, that, that's one of the beginning parts of this. The other related to decolonial justice is this notion of coloniality and why I think phenomenology becomes so important. And it goes back again to, you know, wh what are the terms of decolonial justice and how does that become legible uh, uh, to people? Because um, as long as we are educated through a settler colonial ontology of truth, um, there's so much wisdom, there's so much, there's so many qualities of indigenous oral literary tradition that just won't be heard. Um, Diana, uh, what's her name? Diana Taylor coined this term percepticide, right? In, the, in, in a book about the dirty, uh, the, the dirty war in Argentina. And, um, and you know, she, the percepticide in that sense is when she's talking about uh, that famous photograph of the woman sitting in the cafe and right outside the window and the glass, the police are beating the crap out of this guy and this spectacle of disappearance. And, um, 
And, but then my friend, my friend, and she says, what does that do to you? Like, what does that do to you? That was one of the effectiveness of the dirty war is that it made us turn away. Well, we're still doing that with indigenous people. On the one hand, we're just turning away. Uh, but on the other hand, um, you know, with missing and murdered indigenous women, Black Lives Matter, the same thing. You know, I mean, you know, the, so much, there's just so much turning away. But then a Tsimshian colleague of mine, Michael D'Angeli, um, she adopts that notion of percepticide. And she says um, that uh, uh, when she, she has a very famous dance group, Get Hyatt's Keeper of the Copper Shield, and they go all over the world dancing. And she said to me one time, when I dance in front of non-Indigenous audiences, I can literally feel myself disappear in front of their eyes. And what she means is that what they see is costumes. They don't see real protocol as an expression of sovereignty. They don't see real ceremony as an expression of jurisdiction, right? They see costumes and they see museum pieces. Um, and then of course, I take that notion of percepticide and I read it through a Levinasian lens because Levinas will talk about how that notion of perception harbors within it the, the etymology of the word capera meaning to seize, which is why he, he makes this whole critique of a consciousness of seeing. Um, and that, uh, you, you, you know, I, I think that phenomenologically speaking, you know, in our really embodied sense, uh, that uh, non-Indigenous people don't have the wherewithal to actually hear what's going on. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's all part of it. A friend of mine, uh, a Clinkett friend of mine, uh, Rene Lance Twitchell, he came into my office one day, uh, just him and I closed the door. We used to always complain about coloniality in our institution. And he said to me, he said, they beat about, he's talking about the boarding school experiences. He said, they beat our language out of us and they replaced it with a language that hates us. And he told me that like four or five years ago, I've been thinking about it ever since. And this is why I think phenomenology is so important here. And, um, and then I discovered this beautiful phrase by Gayatri Spivak uh, in, a, in, a, in an essay. Um, she talks about um, the micrological textures of power the micrological textures of power, the power that cuts through the con inner contours of self and affects what we see, what we perceive in this world. Um, and, I, and, and I think that that's, that's, one, that's such an important area where decolonial justice has to be effectuated. It has to be at the phenomenological level. It has to be at the micrological level because micrological percepticide enables macrological genocide. Right. So, sorry, I just like went off and we're losing people, but. <laughs> well, I love it. I love it. Thank you. But yes, we should give others a chance. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to jump on Pushpa's comment or your answer to Pushpa. Um, I wish I could stay here all night and talk about decolonial justice with you, but I've been in my office since 730 and I have to go home soon. But um, when you talked about language and having the you know, language beaten out of you and it's replaced with a language that hates you. Mm -hmm. I had this flash on a poem by Amiri Baraka, which is mm -hmm. called An Agony As Now. And the mm -hmm. opening line is, I am in someone who hates me. Oh, I yeah. look out from his eyes, smell what fouled tunes come into his breath, love his wretched woman yeah. and then it goes on and there in that poem i think he's talking about the same thing that you're talking about with this percepticide mm -hmm. and what happens um i mean i've had that feeling you're standing in front of a group of people you're giving a paper you can literally feel yourself disappear mm -hmm. become yeah. invisible and so i was um i was very struck and moved by your entire presentation um next year in milwaukee We'll get together and stay up all night and drink whiskey and talk about <laughs> decolonial de justice. Fantastic. But for now, um, I haven't seen my husband since 6.30. <laughs> and I think he'd like for me to come home. And I know I would like to come home. So awesome. thank you very much. Thank you. That was, you touched me. And I want to talk phenomenology, too, because I, I agree. Phenomenology is incredibly important. This yeah. whole notion of embodied everything. Yeah that um, the West doesn't understand. And right. this is very much in, you know, very present in the work that I've been doing in Afrofuturism and oh, with yeah. West African oral traditions and all of that. So thank yeah. you very much. I'm so pleased that you accepted our invitation. Well, um, 
um, it was it was delightful seems too small a word word but thank you <laughs> thank you thank you very much Wado. Yeah. That's cool. I don't have a question but I would like to say Wado Galliega thank uh, you for sharing yeah. from the heart of the mountain and the heart of the people yeah right on Wado <laughs> that's cool and I too have been a long time up so I'm heading off now Good night. Awesome. Thanks. I didn't think I'd hear more Cherokee. That's cool. <laughs> if if we want to have one last question, um, then we can end the recording after that one. Um, I guess the promise. If there's, if everybody's just ready to hang out, um, then we can call call an end to the formal recorded part of the discourse ask a question thanks um that was a beautiful presentation really moving um i was a little surprised when you mentioned that on your on the journey uh did i understand correctly that it was someone who was working on the trail who was actually kind of denying the the seriousness of this and the reality the veracity of it and the extent of it and i'm wondering if you pushed back against that a little bit because it's it's concerning that on a trail like this, there's somebody employed there who's like mitigating it. So I'm just it's, curious how you handled that. Yeah, I appreciate that question a lot because it's, it's kind of funny. Um, so it was at the Hawassi River Cultural Heritage Center. Um, as far as I know, it has nothing to do with like the park service or the, the you know, in terms of the, the official Trail of Tears route and all of that. Um, in fact, uh, she told us that, um, that you know there was basically utter historical erasure in that area so like like i said there's nothing about no, no remnants of forecast and all of that and she said that uh, community members in that area wanted to get together and and offer some sort of memorialization of, of the violence and the atrocities that had happened there i mean that really was sort of ground zero of the removal mm -hmm. and um and uh so but it's funny because we uh, she said that and we're in there and my dad looks at me, my daughter looks at me, and we just kind of, okay. And I kind of let, I just let it go. And we walked out and my dad, just, as soon as we get out the door, he's like, I'm so proud of you, son. I could tell you were gonna go off. And I thought, oh no, oh no, here it goes. <laughs> so I actually didn't, uh, I actually didn't engage her. Um, yeah. You know, Cause, cause I, just, I didn't want that, bad social energy to hang on to us when we got back into the car and, and continued on. Um, but I did talk with Barbara Duncan about the experience uh, and she couldn't believe it uh, either. But, but, but this woman who did say all of this stuff to us, you know, at one point right before we left, she says, you know, oh yeah, the remember the removal bike riders come through here. Whenever they come through here, you know, we feed them and I tell them these stories and they always leave crying. And when we got back to the car, I said, well, they're probably crying because she's telling them this awful history, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that, was, that was the extent of it. But, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you explained to your daughter. I, I, I mean, I'm sure it sounds like uh, your daughter learned so much on the trip as well and that you know, it was just another case of denial in many, in yeah. some, you know, it sounds like on, on the, the woman's part and, uh, and I, yeah, your daughter. Yeah, think, was. Exactly, exactly. And my, my daughter, I didn't even have to correct it to my daughter. Once we got in the car, she knew what was all wrong about that story. Yeah. Um, but then of course it was later on that day that we encountered the Nancy, the Daughters of the American Revolution and their memorial for Nancy Ward. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, so this woman at the Hawassi Heritage Center, I mean, she's one little, you know, piece in this uh, counter memory um, historical erasure. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, she needs to be corrected, but not scapegoated, you know, right. because it's just ubiquitous. Good for you. Thank you. I've learned so much tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> So can I just say before, uh, before we end, just how absolutely honored I was uh, to, to be here and to be part of this today and uh, to have you speak about me like that really uh, touches me very deeply. It feels uh, like things that happened to you very 
uh, non-coincidental. Um, and uh, so, so it is a coming together of many things. And, and I just want to say uh, how, how moved I am at how far you've taken philosophy into ethics, into the very heart of ethics, and, and begun to understand the, the world in that way. And, and I have so much to learn. Uh, from you and uh, the space that you have created. Um, so, so thank you, and, and I can't wait to, to learn about that. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. I mean, seriously, you, like you planted these seeds. It's amazing, and we, we, we can't wait 12 years. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up very soon. So, so thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you, Wim. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Thank you, Wim. <laughs>